yet this is true for all. typically be non-interesting, but if you happen to have written it down and you raise it to the p power, you're certainly going to get the original element back. If you take any non-zero element and you raise it to the p power, this says you get the original element back. So it says take any element of zp, I don't care what you call it, call it a, b, x, y, p, q, c, d, I don't really care, call it suggestively a plus b, so if I take something and I raise it to the p power, well, folks, I don't care what that is. Something in zp. And what we've just proved is that if you take anything in zp and you raise it to the p, you get itself back. That's sort of sweet. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what I'm supposed to show is that a plus b to the p is a to the p plus b to the p. Yeah, but what's a? It's a to the p. What's b? b to the p. That's really nice. That is really nice. Now, the slight disadvantage of this proof, this, young, this is really nice, I like this a lot. The slight disadvantage of this proof is that it's only legit in a situation where you have Fermat's theorem working for you. And the only ring that we prove that happens in is z sub p. So technically, this proof, while really nice and significantly more, I don't know, subtle or maybe uh, cleaner than this one, uh, only works in zp, whereas the sort of grinded out proof works not only in zp, but will work for any ring of characteristic p. And we noted last Wednesday that, for example, ZPX or something like that is a ring of characteristic P as well, even though it's not just the ZP itself. Okay. All right, so there's a maybe grossly exaggerated hint on. I, I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what that. What is that problem? Oh, 40. That was 41, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the other problem that I'll give you a quick hint on is. Uh, in section 19, number 3, uh, you're asked to find all the zeros of this polynomial. And the polynomial they gave you, I asked you to change to a different polynomial, x squared plus 3x plus 2. And the book gives you a sort of a, a method to systematically find all the zeros in Z6 of a certain polynomial. but and we'll see this as well. What we're doing a lot of folks is sort of setting you up for the situation that when we get to the specific rings that look like polynomials with coefficients taken from a field that we've got some experience with those. Uh, what we'll wind up doing here is just take this polynomial. If you're asked to decide, well, view it as coefficients in Z6, how many zeros does it have in Z6? Z6 only got six elements in it, so just drop all six elements in the polynomial and see which ones kick out zero. And what this example is designed to do is to show you that if we're working in a situation where the coefficients are taken from something other than a field, like Z6 is not a field, because well, six is not prime, that some of the things that you know about polynomials when the coefficients are taken from the reals or the complexes or something like that, like a degree two polynomial can only have at most two zeros. Here we're going to get a degree two polynomial, and I'll, I'll give away the answer, sort of, that has four different zeros. So you have more zeros than the degree of the polynomial, and the reason that can happen is because you happen to be working in, uh, in a, a setting where the, the uh, coefficients are being taken from something that's not a field. So that's the, the point of uh, question number three there. Okay. All right. Other questions or comments? Or, yeah. All right. All right. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to finish up some, this is sort of a, I don't know, hodgepodge of topics tonight. So we're going to finish up some 
things that we've already seen. I'll introduce a couple of new ideas tonight, and then hopefully by the end I'll give you sort of the, the overview of where we're headed with the, the study of rings. There's lots of different directions that we could take, all of them good, but uh, the one that we're going to choose to take is the direction that will allow us to lead up to the material that will be in the Math 4 slash 515 course next semester. Uh, fortunately, though, the material that we will wind up focusing on in rings turns out to be of interest in its own right. So if you're not planning to take the, uh, the follow-up semester to this course, that's fine. The material that we'll look at this semester, I think, is inherently of interest and uh, is actually sort of useful in some applications as well. So, Okay, so here are some sort of cleanup ideas. Uh, remark on characteristic of a ring. Characteristic of a ring R. Um, we officially defined this last Wednesday just as a brief review or refresher. Here's what this means. If you take uh, a ring with unity, call it one, you add one to itself a bunch of times, Sometimes you eventually kick out zero when you do that, and sometimes you don't. The characteristic of the ring is either the smallest positive integer so that when you add one to itself so many times you get zero, or if you never get zero when you add one to itself, like if the ring is the integers or the real numbers or something like that, then we say that the characteristic of the ring is zero. Okay? And so uh, n is characteristic of r means is the smallest uh, positive n, n with 1 added to itself n times equal to 0. And the point is, if I tell you that I've got a ring of characteristic 2 or characteristic 3 or characteristic 4 or whatever it is, <coughs> Intuitively, it means that whatever the characteristic is, whatever that number is, is treated as zero in that ring. So, for instance, if I tell you the ring has characteristic three, all right, so I've told you that if you take whatever the multiplicative identity is one and you add it to itself three times that you get zero. What that means is that somehow any element in the ring, when added to itself three times, also gives you zero. Then the punchline is if characteristic of R is N, and A is any element of R, then if you add A to itself n times, you get zero. Well, you, yeah, let's see. Let me make sure I understand the question line. So if the question is, could it become zero sooner? Is that the question? For any other element it might become zero sooner for some other elements. In other words, if n is the smallest number that makes 1 equal to 0, it might be the case that if you hand me something else that you get there quicker. I'll give you a quick example. So the characteristic of um, z sub 8 is 8, right? Just because you add 1 to itself and it takes you 8 whacks to get back to 0. But I could hand you the number 4 in that ring, and 4 plus 4 is already zero after two whacks. So there might be elements that get you there quicker. But the point is, if you do this sum to any element in the ring that many times, you're guaranteed to always be looking at zero. Okay? So the, the only minimum value is, it's the minimum value that uh, takes the element one and gets you back to zero. And so the reason is, well, what is a plus a plus plus a n times? It's easy. It's factoring a out. But this is 0, which is a times 0, which is 0. Now you've got to be a little bit careful. So what that means is if I tell you the characteristic is 2, any time you add an element to itself, you can get 0 which is sort of maybe a little bit strange the first time you look at it because you're thinking, well, does that mean the ring doesn't have very much 
guts to it? And the answer is no, the ring could in fact have infinitely many elements in it, even though each time you add an element to itself, you get zero. Well, that's fine. It's doing a lot of adding of elements to other elements, not necessarily to itself. So a good example is, example, here's the ring. R is the polynomials with coefficients taken from Z2. It's an infinite ring. Well, there's lots of things, and there's lots of polynomials. Now, admittedly, I haven't given you much choice on what coefficients to use in those polynomials. You only get to use zeros and ones as coefficients because those are the only elements sitting inside this ring. That's all right. But x is in there, x squared is in there, x plus x squared is in there, x plus x squared plus x to the fifth is in there. But if I hand you something like x plus x, that's zero because it's 2x, and 2 is the same as 0. Or if I hand you x cubed plus x cubed, you get 0. Or if I hand you 1 plus x plus 1 plus x, you get 0. Because I think it's 2 plus 2x, but the 2's always sort of you know, just melt down to 0. So the ring is infinite. Infinitely many polynomials with coefficients taken from um, Z2, but every element, let's call it A, A in R has A plus A equals zero, because the characteristic of this ring is two. All right, there's a remark on characteristic of a ring. That was a good one. Uh, yeah, okay, we did that, we did that, uh, next, let's see, we did, I don't think I did this example for you, so um, recall, and I've already looked at this result already, this thing that we called little Fermat's theorem. In ZP, if P is prime, uh, then A to the P minus 1 equals 1 in ZP for all uh, A not equal to 0 in ZP. So if I hand you something that's not the 0 element in ZP, and I raise it to the P minus 1, then I get 1. Well, what we're going to do here is interpret elements in ZP as simply being remainders on division by P. So if you take something, and I'm working in Z7 or something like that, and I ask you to look at the integer 24, but view it as an element of ZP, well, you just divide 7 into 24, and you get remainder 3. And so 24 is viewed as the element 3 inside ZP. But if we sort of take that. I don't know if we allow ourselves to go back and forth between what's happening inside ZP and what's happening inside Z for all integers, then we can use this result to ask questions about various divisibility properties inside the integers. So we can use this, for example, to ask, uh, example, find the remainder, the remainder when, let's see what example I want to use here, when 8 to the 62 is divided by 13. I think I didn't have time to do this follow-up example when we looked at um, little Fermat's theorem, Fermat's little theorem. Okay. Um, all right, so here's the idea. When we're taking an integer and viewing it as an element in ZP, it's simply asking, well, what integer do you get when you divide by the given modulus here? Here the modulus is P, which in this case is going to be 13, and tell me what the remainder is. All right, well, let's see. Here's the idea. What we know is this, that 8 is not equal to 0 in Z13. And that's an important observation to start with. It's not because 8's not divisible by 13. That's fine. 
Oh, so what does that mean? So for Ma's little theorem, FLT or LFT, however you want to, for Ma's little theorem, says that if you take 8 to the p minus 1 power, well, here 13 is prime, uh, 13 minus 1 is 12, equals 1 in Z13. So here's what that tells me. I'm interested in saying something intelligent about a to the 8 to the 62nd. Well, I can at least get something close to 8 to the 62nd power into the act just by judiciously picking a power to raise both sides of this equation to. How about let's raise both sides to the fifth. So 8 to the 12 to the fifth is 1 to the fifth in Z13. Yeah, if you take two expressions that are equal inside some ring and you multiply them by themselves the same number of times, then the resulting outcomes will be the same. Oh, so what does that mean? Well, we have exponentiation here. 8 to the 12th to the 5th, 8 to the 60th is 1 in Z13. Mm -hmm. And now we're in business because I'm trying to say something about well, what happens when you divide 13 into 8 to the 62nd power? What we've now observed is that if you divide 13 into 8 to the 60th, well, inside Z13, that's the same as 1. So the remainder when you divide 13 into 8 to the 60th is 1. But that's not the question. It's what happens when you divide 13 into 8 to the 62nd. Well. Just cleaning things up, hey, if I multiply both sides of this equation by 8 squared in Z13, ah, so 8 to the 62nd is then the same as 8 squared in Z13. And that reduces the multiplicative load significantly because I can probably figure out what 8 squared is. In other words, it's 64 in Z13, which is what, 12? What is that? If you divide 13 into 64, well, let's see, 13 times 4, for those of you that play cards, that's an important computation, plus, let's see, what's that? That's 52 plus 12, right? And so the remainder when you divide 13 into 64 is 12, so the punchline is if you want the remainder when you divide 13 into 8 to the 62nd power, so the remainder it gives remainder 12 on division by 13. So Fermat's little theorem is pretty nice. It allows you to compute with potentially large exponents just by saying, well, hey, every time you see a certain, uh, a certain integer relative to the modulus that you're dividing by, you can replace that, bless you, you can replace that by the number one. Okay. All right. Question, what happens if the modulus that we're working in isn't prime? Well, we know a lot about z sub n when n isn't prime, but the information we know about it is sort of negative information. It's not an integral domain. It's got zero divisors in there. So your first reaction is, well, we probably can't say much, and that's not a bad intuition to have, but it turns out we can actually say something about similar types of results, a sort of faux little Fermat's theorem even in situations where the modulus, where the, the z sub n value isn't a prime. So it turns out, uh, even though it's not as nice, even though the ring z sub n is not a field, heck, it's not even an integral domain, not even an integral domain, when n isn't prime, when n 
is, I'll use the standard terminology, when n is composite, that means not prime, that means you can write n as the product of two integers each bigger than one but less than n. Okay. Um, we still have some control on the units of Zn. So here's the point, folks. If I hand you one of these Zn rings, if n is prime, then we've proved that every non-zero element is a unit. In other words, that uh, Z sub n is a field when n is prime, and that's precisely the situations that we were able to prove for Maslow theorem or a little for Mas theorem. And the question is, what if we're working inside something like Z6 or Z12 or Z10 or Z20 or Z25, something where the modulus is not prime, do we still have the same sort of result? Is it the case that if you take an integer and raise it to the n minus 1 that you get 1? And the answer is definitely no. So note here, in general, in general, the direct generalization generalization of Fermat's theorem Fermat's theorem does not hold when n is composite let's see let's do an example here uh, Example, let's see, in Z6, if I do 2 to the fifth, let's see what I get. I don't want to do that one. Let's see. Yeah, let's do this one. In Z4. That's better. This would be an easier example. I'm going to take something not zero, and I'm going to raise it to the 4 minus 1 power. The question is, do I get 1? Well, let's see. 2 raised to the 4 is 2 cubed, which is 8. But inside z sub 4, what's that? 0. So it's certainly not equal to 1. That's too bad. So the question is, you know, do we just give up and say, well, okay, when we have a non-prime modulus, all is lost? And the answer turns out to be no. We can't make as powerful a statement as we did with Vermaasel theorem, but there's still something to be salvaged here, and here's what it is. The proposition is the following. Proposition, we're going to prove something about the Z sub n rings that we haven't seen yet. Let's see. In... This was two lectures ago. We looked at the two ideas, units and zero divisors. Units and zero divisors. And what I prove for you is that, in some sense, those two things live on the opposite ends of the spectrum. If you have a unit, it's not a zero divisor. If you have a zero divisor, it's not a unit. And in, I'll say, most rings, those two things live on opposite ends of the spectrum, and there's typically a lot of stuff in the middle. For instance, if you look at the ring of integers, the only units are 1 and minus 1. There's not very many units. There's not very many elements of multiplicative inverses. There's no zero divisors in there. There's nothing that is non-zero that you can multiply with something and get zero. And all the other integers are sort of in between. What we're about to show, though, is that if you happen to look in the particular rings that look like z sub n, in the z sub n rings, you have to be in one or the other of the two camps. There's nothing in between that either you're a unit or you're a zero divisor. So the proposition is, and I'm going to preface this just so that you don't get the, um, the, the wrong idea. Unlike most rings, this is unlike the integers, it's unlike the rationals, it's unlike, it's unlike well, uh, it's unlike polynomials, it's unlike most rings, it turns out if you're looking in a specific ring that looks like z sub n, 
uh, every element, every non-zero element is either either a unit or a zero divisor. And I think I may have pointed this out when we looked at that proposition that said units and zero divisors somehow live on the opposite ends of the spectrum. But I don't think I proved the details, and this will be of interest here. Let's see. So what's the proof? Hmm. Well, what you're able to do in the particular rings that look like Z sub n, in these sorts of rings, is, well, you can list out all the elements. They look like, well, I don't want you to look at the zero element. That's just for notational reasons, we don't call it a zero divisor. I know what all the non-zero elements look like. They're the elements 1, 2, 3, up 3, n minus 1. And it turns out there's two possibilities, and each of those two possibilities leads to either being a unit or not a unit. So the proof is this. Um, if So pick any non-zero element in there. Pick any, I'm tired of calling things A. How about any, let's call it B in Z sub n, case 1 the G, C, D of B and N is 1. And case 2 is the G, C, D of B and N is bigger than 1. Remember, G, C, D greatest common divisor. So if you hand me uh, this integer, this integer B, what I'm going to try to do is convince you that, well, let's see, one of these two cases has to hold, and what I'm going to convince you of is if you're in this case, that B is a unit, and if you're in this case, that B is a zero divisor, and that's what will give us the proposition. Let's go ahead and prove case two first. No. In fact, I might do my time here. No, I just want to give you enough info so that you can do one of the problems. So case one, um, this uh, then B is a unit in Z sub N. Yeah, this will be a better way to approach this. Case two then B is a zero divisor in Zn. And I'm going to leave the proofs of these out, use some number theory, which I think in the interest of time, I'm going to just suffice to show you by means of a specific example how this works out. So for instance, if we look in, uh, I know R equals, how about Z12? Yeah, this would be a good example. All right, so, L, uh, so 12 is composite, obviously. Then the claim is, if I go through all the non-zero elements, what this proposition says is, if you pull an element out of there, tell me what its GCD with 12 is. If the GCD with 12 is 1, that you've written down a unit. And if the GCD with 12 is bigger than 1, then you've written down a zero divisor. So let's see how that works. So if I take 1, well, the GCD of 1 and 12 is 1. The GCD of 2 and 12 is 2. So what I'm going to do is separate these out into two camps. The GCD of 3 with 12 is 3. So that's bigger than 1. The GCD of 4 with 12 is 4, which is bigger than 1. The GCD of 5 with 12 is 1. The GCD of 6 with 12 is 6. The GCD of 7 with 12 is, seven, uh, is 1. The GCD of 8 with 12 is 4. The GCD of 9 with 12 is 3. The GCD of 10 with 12 is 2. And the GCD of 11 with 12 is 1. So what I've just done here, folks, is I've split the integers from 1 to 11 up into the two cases that I've mentioned here. The situation where the GCD of the integer with 12 is 1, and the case where the GCD of the integer with 12 is bigger than 1. And what I'm just going to do in this particular case, rather than going through the details of the proof, is show you that all the things on this list GCD of blank with 12 equals 1. And the things on this list, GCD of blank with 12 bigger than 1, all the things on this list are units, and all the things on this list are zero divisors. 
And then we can use this result that we proved two times ago that says, hey, if you're on this list, you can't be on this list and vice versa. All right, I'm going to prove that all the things on this list are units by exhibiting their multiplicative inverses, by writing down another element in Z12 so that when you look at the product, you get 1 mod 12. How about 1 times 1? Boy, that was easy. That's 1 mod 12. <laughs> How about this one? If I take 5 and I multiply it by 5, I get 25, which in Z12 is 1. In Z12, if I look at 7, turns out if you multiply by 7, you get 49, which is 1 in Z12. So 7's a unit. In fact, it turns out here, let's see if I take 11, guess what? 11 times 11 is 1 in Z12, because 11 times 11 is 121. So in fact, what I've shown you is that not only is it the case that each of the integers from 1 to 11 that are relatively prime to 12 is a unit inside z sub 12, it actually happens that each element is its own inverse. All right, now here's a homework problem that you're doing to turn in this time. What you showed was if you look inside any ring, not just this one, and you look at the subset consisting of the units, well, presumably I've just done that, that the units form a group under multiplication. So using that homework problem, I've now got a group, because here presumably are the units of z sub 12. It's a group under multiplication. It's got four elements. Each non-identity element has the property that when you combine it with itself, you get one. Anybody want to venture a guess what the group of units of Z12 looks like? It's isomorphic to what group? Z2 cross Z2, perfect. Or V. If you said V, then you said the correct answer, too. It's a group with four elements having the property that every non-identity element has order two, or rephrased where every element in the group has square equal to the identity. So that's sort of cool. Right, so there's some group theory coming up in the context of rings. Now, on the other hand, let me convince you that each of the elements on this other list, the integers whose GCD with 12 is bigger than 1, are zero divisors in Z12. So what I'm going to do over here is rather than trying to pair each of these numbers up with something whose product is 1 in Z12, over here I'm going to try to pair each of these up with some non-zero element in Z12 so that the product of the two non-zero elements is zero in Z12. That's the definition of zero divisor. Two times six is zero in Z12. Three times four is zero in Z12. Four times three is zero in Z12. Six times two is zero in Z12. Eight times three is zero in Z12. Nine times four is zero in Z12. And 10 times, who knows, six, is 0 and Z12, all in Z12. Again, I have not proved the general case for you, but it turns out what I've done is shown you in detail, at least inside Z sub 12, how it is that in the Z sub n ring, you're either a unit or a zero divisor. For those of you that are interested in how the general proof works, it's really not too bad. You need to know about a half hour's worth of elementary number theory. This statement follows from what's called the linear combination theorem. If you have two relatively prime integers, in other words, GCD equaling 1, then you can find integers u and v such that b times u plus n times v is 1. That's the linear combination theorem, and that allows you to show that b is necessarily a unit. And on the other hand, if the GCD is bigger than 1, then it's not too bad to do. I mean, all you then have to do is sort of pair up the integer with what it's sort of divisor is. So the GCD of 2 with 12 is 2, and 12 divided by 2 is 6. And that's how you can sort of write down its corresponding pair that would give you a product equal to 12, where neither of the two terms in the product is 0. All right. Well, with this in mind, we can then actually write down the generalization of Fermat's theorem. And here's how it goes. The definition is this. Inside Z12, here's the 
notation that I think was used in the problem. Um, the units or so for homework, you, know, you show that, which problem was that? The units of the ring problem is a group. Is it 37? No. 37? In section 18, number 37, that the units of R for any ring under multiplication is a group. I think they just call it U, but here I'll be more emphatic. It's the units of the ring R. So we're going to give this thing a name. When R is Zn, the number of elements in the units of Zn Well, that's sort of interesting. So what I'm asking you to do is look inside the Zn ring and tell me how many units are in there. Well, if n is prime, then Zn is a field. So everything except for 0 is a unit. So if n is a prime, then this number is n minus 1. But if n is not a prime, like if n is 12, well, then the number happens to be 4. So the question is, there some algorithm that allows you to, in general, write down what this number is? Uh, y yes and no. I'll say, at least for our purposes, the answer is no. But we're going to give this number a name. We're going to call it is defined to be to be the symbol symbol phi. It's Greek letter phi of n, and this is called the Euler phi function. Example, if P is prime, then phi of P is, well, it's the number of units in Z sub P. Well, I know what that number is. It's P minus 1. Let's just if I'll show you why in a minute. Okay. On the other hand, we just showed if um, N equals 12, then the number of units in z sub 12, well, we just look. And there turns out to be four of them. Bless you. So we're led to, yeah, good. OK. One last reminder of group theory. And it's nice, because we're working inside rings, but we keep harking back to results that we proved about groups. Remember this Lagrange uh, consequence inside groups? If you hand me a group, you did this one for homework, you tell me how many elements are in the group. It's a finite group. Let's call that number, and I don't want to use n, even though that's the notation that was used in the problem. If you have uh, z elements in your group, so if your group is Z is, is S3, you got Z equals 6 or something like that. If you have a group with six elements, and you take any element in the group and you raise it to the sixth power, you get the identity. Consequence of Lagrange's theorem. So we proved consequence of Lagrange's theorem. If you tell me the order of the group and you take any element in the group and you combine that element with itself, that many times you always get the identity in the group. That's how we proved for Ma's little theorem. Because we looked inside, when P was prime, we looked inside the group consisting of the non-zero elements of the field. That group had P minus 1 elements in it. So Lagrange's theorem says you take any element in that group, in other words, any non-zero element of Zp, and you raise it to the P minus 1 power, and you get the identity element. What we're about to do is simply write down the same idea here. So corollary consequence is this. If A is a unit in Zp, oh, I'm sorry, in Zn, then if you take A and you raise it to the number of elements inside this group, well, by definition, that's how many elements are in this group, that you get 1 in Z sub n. I 
notice what just happened here. If I happen to be in the specific case where n is prime, then all I'm writing down here, folks, is if you take a unit in z sub p, in other words, if you take any non-zero element in z sub p, and you raise it to the p minus 1 power, you get 1 in z p. That's just for Mosdell theorem restated. But it turns out that this same result can be extended. It doesn't matter whether you're working in z sub p where p is a prime or not. Just look at the group of units inside zn. How many elements are in there? Might not be easy to count. Here's the notation we use for that number. So for instance, that number happens to be 4 when n is 12. But the punchline is take any element in this group, in the units of zn, raise it to however many elements are in the group, p of n, you'll get 1 in the group. And this is usually given a name. This is called Euler's generalization of Fermat's theorem. Generalization of Fermat's theorem. And it all, I mean, both of them just boil down to using Lagrange's theorem on the appropriate group of units, whether the group of units happens to be all the non-zero elements of z sub n or not. All right, so for example, let's see, example. Oh, well, let's just look at the situation that we've already seen. There are four units inside z sub 12. So that says if you hand me any of the units inside z sub 12 and you raise them to the fourth power that you'll necessarily get one. And well, that, in fact, is the case. In fact, it happens to be the case that we get there quicker on all these elements. There will be situations where you can't get there quicker. In other words, you'll need the full phi of n in order to get some elements, but not all the time. Okay. All right, questions? So uh, the quick example might be, let's see, find the remainder remainder when, uh, let's see, 13 to the hundredth is divided by, by what, 24. Manifestly not a prime number, but that's okay because the element that I'm starting with, 13, is relatively prime to 24. So since the GCD of 13 and 24 is 1, that means that 13 is a unit in z sub 24. That's this proposition here. If you hand me something in z sub n, if the GCD of the two numbers is 1, then you've got yourself a unit. Oh, so what does that mean? So by Euler's theorem, so 13 to the 20, uh, to the phi of 24 is 1 in z24. That's what Euler's generalization says. So now all we have to do is figure out what phi of 24 is. It turns out, if you've seen the number theory course, there are some relatively subtle ways of doing it, but at least in the context of the homework problem that I'll give you, Tonight, just pound it out. What's phi of 24? 24 is what? Well, just list out 1, 2, 3, up through 24, and find the units. In other words, find all the things on this list that are relatively prime to, oops, I don't want to give you 24, that's 0, up to 23, up through m minus 1. Find the units. I'll show you how to do that. Let's see, where are the units? The units are precisely not the zero divisors, or the units are precisely those things that have GCD with 24 equal to 1. Well, 1 certainly does. Let's just go through them quickly. 2, no good. 3, no good. 4, no good. 5, yeah, has GCD 5 and 24 is 1. 6, no good. 7, good. 8, no. 9, no. 10, no. 11, 12, no. 13, 14, I mean, any even number is not going to work because it's the GCD of something with an even number. 15, no, because the GCD of 15 and 24 is 3. 16, no. 17, yeah. 18, no, it's even. 19, yeah. 20, no. 21, no. 22, no. 
23, yeah. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So here they are. So phi of 24 then is 8. Simply count up the units, bless you. Okay. So here's what that tells us. So necessarily 13 to the 8th is 1 in Z24. So what? Well, I'm interested in 13 to the 100th. Now we just play the same sort of game that we played before. So 13 to the 8th to the 12 equals 1 to the 12, which is 1 in Z24. Oh, but let's see. I know what 13 to the 8th to the 12 is. That's 13 to the 96th. And then I'll just let you play the same sort of game that we played before. So now you've got 13 to the 96th is 1. Now tell me what 13 to the 100th is. Just multiply both sides by 13 to the 4th. So I'll say etc. That's how you go about finishing up a problem of that type. And you'll see one of those again for the homework that I'll give you tonight. All right. Questions there? Comments? So that's sort of, so I mean, it's nice. The group theory results that we proved actually give us some nice results about the ring structure of these things. Okay. All right. Questions, comments? Did that, did that. Yeah. Do we do all these? Yep. What do I have here? Ten minutes? Perfect. Okay. So... I got three choices. Uh, 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 I won't do that either. All right, let's do this. This is sort of information overload on rings so far. We wrote down examples of rings. What we've been doing is stressing the multiplicative properties of the rings because the additive properties of rings are presumably nice. We, by definition, always have an abelian group when you look at the ring together with the additive structure. And what we've seen over the last three lectures is that the multiplicative structures of rings can differ wildly. Some are commutative, some are not commutative. Some have unity and some don't, but at least the ones that we're going to focus on are all going to be rings with unity. Some are finite, some are not. Some have zero divisors and some don't. Some have the property that every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Those are the fields. Some are integral domains. In other words, some have the property that there's no zero divisors or rephrased. Some have the property that if you take two non-zero elements, you multiply them, you always get something non-zero. There are a lot of those, and there are a lot of those that aren't just fields. Even though we prove fields have that property, there are a lot of examples of those types of rings. The most important ones are the integers. Certainly, there's a lot of elements that don't have multiplicative inverses, yeah, but, there's, uh, but there's no zero divisors in there. And the other important example, which we're going to start in earnest yeah, on Wednesday, will be polynomial rings. We've already looked at those a little bit so far. What we're now going to do is play games that are similar to the games that we played with groups in the sense that we're going to be interested in homomorphisms from one ring to another just like we were interested in homomorphisms from one group to another. We're going to be interested in forming factor rings in the same sort of manner that we formed factor groups. The constructions won't be identical, but the ideas will be similar enough that we won't have to reinvent the wheel on these things. So that when we start looking at, and this is what I'll introduce in the last 10 minutes here, so that when we start looking at things like a homomorphism from one ring to another, when I write down the definition, it won't be as if it's sort of a fresh idea. It'll be, oh, okay. I know what a homomorphism was in the context of a group, 
So once you give me the definition of what a homomorphism is in the context of a ring, you say, all right, yeah, that makes sense because I sort of understood philosophically what the heck a homomorphism was in the context of a group. So what we're about to do is we're going to look at some similar constructions, similar constructions to those in groups, and let me just give you the definition here. Definition, we start with two rings. Let R and S be rings, commutative, I don't care. With unity, I really don't care, although all of the ones that we'll be looking at will have unity. With zero divisors or not, I don't care. Fields or not, I don't care. Then the definition is this, a function I'll suggestively call it phi from R to S is called a homomorphism. So we already used that word. Well, yeah, but now I'm asking you to write down a function from one ring to another. I sometimes will emphasize that the two underlying structures are rings by telling you that I'm writing down what I'm going to call ring homomorphism in case my guess is that all of you could probably guess what the definition is. Here, because we've got two binary operations, we need to stipulate two different equations corresponding to the function phi. In case phi of r plus r prime is phi of r plus phi of r prime. And secondly, phi of r times r prime is phi of r times phi of r prime for all r and r prime in r. All r comma r prime. If this was a month and a half ago, I would not have been so cavalier on the notation. Technically, this addition is happening inside the ring r. Technically, the addition over here is happening inside the ring s. They may be two different additions. For example, the addition here might be an addition inside the real numbers, and the addition over here might be an addition inside the ring of matrices or something like that. Okay. Similarly here, technically this is multiplication inside R. This is multiplication inside S. But I, you know, we, we sort of understand where all these operations are taking place. And there's no ambiguity because I've told you where the function goes from and goes to. So if you're looking at a symbol that looks like phi of r, you know that it's an element of s, and phi of r prime is another element of s. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just the notion of a group homomorphism sort of expanded to include both of the binary operations that we have in the setting of rings. Okay, so that's a, a ring homomorphism. Big example, and I'll give you the homework assignment that'll be due next Wednesday. We'll get out of here. Example, uh, uh, let n be any integer. Define the following function, phi from the ring of integers to the ring z sub n, where you define phi of uh, little z equals z mod n. And phi is a ring of Uh, proof, I won't write out all the details, so proof, just pound it out, pound it out. All we're using is use properties of modular arithmetic uh, in Z sub n. All this says, folks, is the following. If you hand me two integers and you add them together, and then you ask what's the remainder when you divide by n, is that the same as taking the two remainders and adding them together and ask what's the remainder? Sure it is. Similarly with multiplication, if you have two integers and you multiply them together and ask what's the remainder, is the same as having taken the remainders of each of the two integers individually, multiplying them and then asking what's the remainder, and the answer turns out to be yes as well. So in fact, we used those properties of z sub n already when we were looking at groups. So this will be one of the important examples of a ring homomorphism the significantly more important example, which is what we're putting off tonight, 
will be in the context of uh, polynomial rings. So we'll put that off for a little bit, but we will return to it because that will wind up being our focus for the remainder of the semester. Okay, questions, comments? All right, here then is the next chunk of homework, and this, I think we're close to being back on a more standard schedule. So homework assignment on Monday, this will be due next Wednesday, Wednesday, November 14th, and it'll just be a couple of you know, problems from two sections. Let's see, in section 20, problems 1 through 7 and 10, and the ones I want you to turn in are 3, 4, and 10. And then in section 22, problems 1 through 15, and 21 through 28. And the ones I want you to turn in are 5, 21, and 27. Uh, you're, if you're interested, you can do all the problems in section 20 already. And by the time we're done with uh, the material this Wednesday, you'll be able to do all the stuff in section 22 as well. This is this is on Fermat's little theorem and Euler's generalization, and this stuff.